Hello guys, uh, welcome to today's video. I'm very excited to have today with us uh, Jimmy Hickey. Is that right? I'm, I'm yeah, always absolutely. Happy. You got it. But, and uh, Jimmy is a founder of Finlay Hats and um, it's a very fast growing e-commerce company. They have amazing, unique product that they're selling the hats uh, with special technology. allows you to tight, tighten the uh, the hat or is there like other application for that? Oh, good old application. So first off, thanks for having me, Alex. But yeah, so that is our patented stampede lace on the front of our hat. You can put any color lace on any mm -hmm. color hat. You can mix and match. You can tie it in different styles really easily, just like that. Let me pull that out, kind of awkward angle here. Mm -hmm. but you can tie it in different styles, but you kind of hinted at it. It has a functionality where you can not just tighten it on the up there, but actually bring it down around your chin to keep your hat on your head through good times. So next yeah. time you're out there wakeboarding, jumping out of helicopters, snowboarding, whatever uh, those good times may be, your hat's gonna stay on your head through those good times. And is we also is have that there anything box. else in the marketplace like it? Like where it's like totally unique product. How, how did you get to this? So there's no one, there's no one that can hang with us. We have, we have a beautiful little patent on that. There's some similar like surf hats out there that are very surf specific that are kind of more of a full on chin strap rather than just an accent to the top of the hat that also can be brought down as, as a chin strap as a function, but not just as its main thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the original idea came back when I was like in middle school, uh, rafting down the mighty Toodle River. Uh, this beautiful little river at the foothills of my hometown and uh, Mount St. Helens. Are you familiar with Mount St. Helens, Alex? No. It's cool. Know. So it's like one I of the coolest in, mountains. I live in Florida. I live in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the exact opposite end of the corner of uh, this, the country, we have uh, Mount St. Helens, which is a volcano out here. And it erupted back in wow. 1980. And it's now like a half mountain. It looks awesome. It's just like literally like a mountain that got chopped in half. Um, but the Toodle River's at the base of it. Long story short, we'd go rafting down it every summer. And uh, it's a fun place to raft. You'd, there'd be like cars under the water and like the the sand on the beaches is like wow. ash. It's crazy. But there's one area called the uh, the Hollywood Gorge. I lost my favorite hat when I was rafting through the Hollywood Gorge. Survived. People don't always survive. And uh, I did survive, but my hat didn't. Wow. So next time I went rafting, I didn't want to lose my hat. So I took my uh, pocket knife, cut a little hole in my hat, took my shoelaces out of my shoe and uh, made my first Findlay hat, although I called it my water hat and uh, laced up. Didn't lose my hat rafting that time. And from that moment on, it was uh, my hat I wore every time I was in a situation where I might lose it. And uh, People would always be like, man, that hat's so cool. Where'd you get it? And I was like, I made it myself. And like, well, cool. If you make more, I'll buy one. Like fast forward 10-ish years, decided to make more. And then like, so you sold first, like how did you, you start selling on the internet or like you, you sold to friends like locally or how, how did you get initial momentum? Yeah, so we started in December of 2013 and uh, I come from a photography background. So I've networked with a lot of action sports athletes and just good people kind of across the board. So when we launched, I used that platform of friends who were just micro influencers, but kind of big in their in their own respective sport or area or whatever. Um, and really we just sent out care packages to you know those close friends. And then it slowly kind of grew via word of mouth and a lot of very heavy organic outreach uh, through social media um, with Instagram and Facebook uh, being our two biggest focus and to this day still of our, our two biggest focus. Um, so I mean it started really small. We didn't have a budget. It's I started with I think like twelve or fifteen hundred dollars um in hats. We had like 80 mm -hmm. something hats and uh did it all in my uh living room with my girlfriend at the time Sarah who's still our co-founder here and runs our seamstress department. And mm -hmm. uh yeah just slowly grew from there one day at a time. Wow. So so this small like micro influencers, right? So first it were like just the friends, people that you knew. So we would, what you would send them, like send them the package, like with item, like carefully, you know, package, nice packaging, some, <laughs> some yeah. gift, like message, right? Mostly, yeah. And I mean, we're talking like, yeah, we would just send a hat with a little sometimes handwritten note, sometimes just uh, our basic stuff. And, and we would send it with no strings attached. It was not send that, you know, we're going to send you this and we expect X, Y, and Z. It's, hey, we'd love to have you wearing a Finley hat. Here's a uh, one that we thought you might like, or check check one out. Let us know what one you want, and we'll send it to you. And we send it no strings attached, no expectations. And uh, obvious now in the day and age of influencers, it's a little bit there's more expectations, right? At least on bigger scale people, and even medium to small now. But mm -hmm. at least in 2013, it was really easy to get out and uh, get in front of people who might have you know 5,000 followers. But those 5,000 people are very engaged and very like you know follow that person closely. So mm -hmm. uh, those little micro influencers who I knew through photography were definitely 
pivotal and or uh, not pivotal, but very important to our, our early stage growth. That's interesting. And you mentioned that you do that to, to this day, this yeah. outreach. Yep, we do heavy outreach. And we're a good uh, takeaway for anyone listening that uh, has not dabbled into TikTok. We highly recommend it. The, there's the beautiful phrase that I'm sure anyone in the marketing world knows that marketers ruin everything. I'm going to <laughs> start the start this one to, for us so we can ruin uh, TikTok. Because uh, right now the influencers on there are just completely inexperienced with dealing with opportunities from brands. And uh, mm. you can find people with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers on TikTok who are open for the simplest of care packages and will give you huge shout outs, major, major reach for barely any cost. We're talking, we'll send like two or three hats and get long video shout outs on hundreds of thousands of uh, views through TikTok. Yeah, it's been, uh, we have one of our main social media guys who just does a lot of outreach. His focus has super shifted onto TikTok just because it's it's definitely being slept on through those opportunities. And again, we're sending them with, with no expectations, but some of them are evolving to actually like making hats for the people. And then wow, that's awesome. yeah. And do you do you pay them like in any cases or like you, you just do this type of like product? So it varies. Uh, Most of the people we're, we're sending out a couple care packages a day right now. Uh-huh. So we're not we're not sending it with cash or anything. But for some of the bigger accounts, especially the ones with the most loyal following, uh, we'll do a collaboration where we actually use their design on one of our hats. And then we launch a hat that's limited edition on our website. And then we give them a commission on every hat sold. So they use it to promote to their audience. And then their audience gets you know some unique keepsake of someone that they follow and enjoy. And then we get all of these new customers from it. So it's kind of a win-win. And then they get paid for basically doing nothing other than shouting us out or making a quick video with the hat we sent them or making their normal content while wearing our hats. Um, so we send them in that case, but we're not, again, we're, we're not paying for shout outs on there. And uh it's, you know, a just completely different playing field than it is on Instagram right now and compared to TikTok mm-hmm. as far as getting cheap people there. So sorry for ruining that, though, because I know that's not going to be a thing for much longer. I mean, it's, it's but it's very interesting concept. And, and yeah, it's like the way you said, like marketers haven't to be in like TikTok yet. <laughs> so it's <laughs> that's that's a very good point. Um, do you advertise also paid advertising like Snapchat, TikTok, or it's mostly just organic outreach? At least for on, on what end? We, like we do advertise across the board. Yeah, we, uh, um, we just started experimenting with TikTok ads and we're seeing super low CPMs, not high conversion, but we haven't fully tweaked. I don't even know if our pixels a hundred percent set up, right. Cause it's for the, for the amount of amount of traffic we're getting, like the conversion is just not what it would make sense. Like with our conversion rate is, is pretty high. So I mm-hmm. think there's something off with the pixel. So we've only been doing it for like a couple of weeks at this stage. Um, but the CPM is really low. So we know we're getting like at least semi-qualified traffic through the site, through TikTok, which is cool. It's about mm-hmm. half the cost is uh, um, we're spending on uh, for CPM on Facebook's ad manager. So we're definitely experimenting there and want to try to, you know, figure the right way to do it. How Facebook is performing for you right now? It's doing really well. Um, you know, we, we just got through the holiday season slash political, you know, election year stuff. So it was, yeah. it wasn't ideal. And obviously it's I, everyone in that space, uh, you know, f- felt it, but for the year we're, we're still in a really solid, strong position with it. And our strategies are fairly straightforward and simple. And uh, we really, this last year, this is 2020, we, we did a big change in how we did things where we kind of shifted from seasonal launches to weekly launches of smaller runs of hats. Mm-hmm. And as a result, by having these limited edition drops every single week, we do a lot of the production right here in Portland. So it's easy for us to make 30 hats, 50 hats, 100 hats, whatever. So we will do these limited drops every single week, twice a week. And again, any, there's usually two to six or seven styles with each one, varying from 10 to 100 plus. It kind of varies. But we switched up our strategy this year and we saw a lot of that. That really helped our just everything across the board. Sales went up, our return on ad spend went up, You know, our repeat customer rate went up just everything went up just based on that one little strategy shift of launching way more stuff and it's a production nightmare it's not easy and it's tough to yeah. like yeah, yeah that, that was actually that was actually the other thing so i'm thinking like two products like launching like obviously there's design right there's the printing there's like all of these like moving parts yeah from that perspective it it probably is like consu- energy consuming it's definitely energy consuming and it's one of my biggest focuses and and we've you know uh 
we've we've increased our staff up to 18 people now so what's what that's been able and it's a lot of it's on the production end so uh that's given me a cool opportunity to really focus on the few things that are moving forward with the brand which is the pr- uh, product launches and then our content mm-hmm. and then outreach and that side of things so but so with with my focus being on just the product launches it's it's a little bit it's it's a lot of moving parts but at the same time because we have such a strong team and we do so much here it's it's not too crazy to take three hats say we want this design this color on this one that design that color you know so it's it's it, we've got it down to a system and a science but it's it you know took a while to get to that stage but regardless i guess the big takeaway from that is by shifting our focus from having just you know a big selection on our website for for seasons at a time the mm-hmm. fact that we switched it up to just weekly launches where some hats will sell out in two minutes you know and some will be up there there's, a day there's the, like formula factors right like i don't want to miss totally. this out because it's like exactly yeah. And so we, uh, we've definitely been able to, that, that's helped a lot and it's helped our ad account a lot too, just by having those, the weekly drops consistently have a very high return. Have you noticed that like uh, Snapchat traffic or like TikTok traffic, like that you use the same pixel, right? Like you're driving traffic the same. Have you noticed a drop in performance on the, ad, on the Facebook side when you drive like a lot of quality of lower quality traffic? No. And I, to be fair, I haven't looked at it too deep between it to get like a really good analytical approach on that. My theory at this stage with TikTok is it's still not the, I mean, I I know it skews younger, but I think a lot of, at least the people we're targeting on it aren't in that necessarily that age group. So they will still, by getting to hitting our website, they'll still be getting the uh, retargeting through other outlets, through whatever's like on, you know, managed through Facebook's ad manager or in their network. So I think even though we might be getting some lower quality traffic through them, I think we're not seeing any major decrease. Also, the scale of it isn't too high. I mean, we're only spending 100 or 50 a day right now on TikTok. So it's it's mm-hmm. very like experimental. So, you know, it, it's not a major shift in a lot of extra traffic yet. So, but what'll be interesting to see is I'm sure it's, you know, there's something off with it. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and it probably will get better over time as they accumulate more data, they know who's buying what, they, they, they'll, they're targeting and everything will start to become like more precise. Totally. Yeah, it makes sense. How is, um, I, I read the story of your brand. So at one point you had, uh, because like the design of, of, of the item, like it's quite unique, right? You developed and then you had another company basically just copying what you had. Yeah. So, um, and this was years ago and it was before our patent had fully gone through, but yeah. So a major retail chain in malls that is definitely not in our demographic, really. It's, I don't want to shout them out because they don't deserve the, the free publicity through you, but <laughs> they, they're not cool. Just imagine a store in, in the mall that's like not exciting and it's them, or you might not have even heard of them or paid it any attention, but, uh, and no offense to anyone that likes that spot. It's just not my style. And I'm kind of frustrated. They legitimately stole off, uh, you know, they took our idea, uh, but they, they executed it really poorly and didn't actually understand the functionality of the laces. They basically just did it all off of looks, but didn't actually know that there was a function like the lace to be brought around your chin. Um, so yeah, they took our logo. They took a very similar graphic from our lineup and, uh, they actually also took the diamond supply co logo and like turned our logo into theirs. Use like our triangle to make a diamond either way. Uh, yeah, they stole from us and there was really nothing we could do because we didn't have the patent and our patent attorney said that because we don't have it, it doesn't make sense to try to fight them right now because they could just slow down the potential of us getting the patent if they were to try to fight us back over it. So we basically just had to sit on the sidelines and just watch as there is a complete ripoff of our brand uh, being sold for cheaper than we sell our hats wholesale. I mean, wow. they were like, yeah, they were, they were bottom of the barrel quality and super cheap at a bad company. So luckily that they only did one run and they never reordered and uh, it's an issue in the past, but to combat that, especially early on, we really, we, we didn't know if the idea for the laces would be patented or could be patented. So a family friend suggested who was an attorney, but like, real estate. Long story short, he said that we need to focus more on our community to if we ever do have someone steal our idea, um, the community will step in and be like, nope, that's a Finley hat. That's Finley's technology. That's, you know, and cut it off and then, uh, you know, make it really tough to steal our idea. Even if we're not protected legally, we're protected by the community. So from day one, building that community has been a huge piece of who we are and our focus. And one of my favorite pieces of the brand is that community. And they're called the Findlay Force. That's some nice alliteration for you, Alex. But uh, 
Yeah. And that, that's not just our, our tribe around the brand. That's our community. That's yeah. the people who, when they see someone out on the street, wearing a hat, they say nice, nice Finley hat. And they, they, people have started discussions and friendships through that. And we have a group of collectors on Facebook. So wow. shout out to the groups on Facebook. Cause it's a super slept on tool. And we have, I think 1200 in our main group and then over a thousand or close to a thousand in our buy, sell trade group. Uh -huh. And it's nuts. It's, it's a self-contained little community of people that share photos, share tips, share teasers, talk about trades that they did, post pictures of what they ordered. They're great for uh, us to, we can submit ideas to them and they will let us know their feedback instantly for free. It's like a, it, it's an wow. amazing little tool for us. And on top of that, talk about the, the weekly exclusive stuff. These are the people that are actively refreshing the website throughout the week, trying to see when we do a sneaky release or a, doing stuff like that. So they're you know, wow. a pretty loyal and uh, committed group. And that's all by design. And that was uh, originally there to protect us if, uh, in case of a patent infringement or idea uh, theft. And so you have like, what's typically the repeat ratio? Like how often the, the customers, like on average, like what percentage of customers buy again? The, I mean, I know like weekly or monthly we have a high, like 40, 50% is our repeat customer rate. Wow. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty dang heavy, but we, we have some collectors that we did a post a couple of weeks ago to see like where the average amount was. Uh -huh. um, and that we have, most people have like 20 to 50 hats, like in that zone. And it's, it's a cool place to be in because, you know, there's, I know in so many e-commerce places, like you only need one toaster, you know, you only yeah. need <laughs> one keyboard. And it's like, we're launching hats that like people, you know, can, switch out daily we you know wear a different one every single day of the month or have one that they keep on ice and just you know do that or have one they want for trade so we have a really high repeat customer rate and we have a big focus too on keeping that retention and keeping people involved in it so yeah that's definitely a big focus for us and we have uh, a lot of email flows set up to keep people engaged and keep people you know involved along the road so we know if I, it's around the 60 day mark is when we're, we're looking for that second purchase. So, you know, we have stuff that's designed to hit right around there to kind of get them back in into mm -hmm. it. And then, you know, we have various other steps along the way after their first purchase to try to get them back in. But yeah, I mean, our repeat customers are, are huge, right? It's, it's way easier to bring someone back than it is to bring someone new. So, and so how do you like, did you like do it in house? Like the whole like email sequences, you like masterminded all of these sequences, all of these, or you had someone like helping you out some agency. Um, yeah, we worked with an agency at first. Um, we're no longer with them, but huge shout out to them. E-commerce growers. They're awesome. Soli and Chris, uh, well, Tyler Sullivan from uh, um, Bomb Tech Golf. Super interesting guy. If you haven't had him on your podcast, I highly recommend it because I've learned, he's one of my biggest influences and I've learned a lot from that guy. Mm -hmm. um, but they are like Clavio experts and uh, they helped us get the initial flows set up uh -huh. and just kind of unlock the the power of e-commerce or of uh, email marketing. And yeah, so we worked with them and now I, I handle it. And we, we've again, simplified the process. Now that we have the, the flows set up, there's only a little bit of tweaks here and there. And it's like stuff with low open rates will get adjusted to be, try to get higher open rates. And, you know, there's little tweaks, but it's it, no major strategy stuff other than a few, you know, stuff popped in. And then we keep our email uh, newsletter style stuff only like once or twice a month, but each email we send out brings in, you know, thousands of dollars in sales for, uh, from newsletter stuff. So it's pretty powerful. And I know their whole theory is like, you should be doing like 20% of your business, uh, just through email. And mm -hmm. I think ours is a little under that. I want to say kind of between 10 and 15% of our business is generated through email, depending on if we're sending out, uh, what those emails we're sending out look like for newsletter stuff, but news, their email has been huge. And it, in the past, it was never a big focus for us. We had no flow set up. We had nothing. So that's been a big, you know, you thing. do any SMS. Uh, yeah, we do. We just do it for abandoned cart recovery. And so no, uh, no other marketing via SMS other than abandoned cart. Um, but we use a platform through Shopify for that. And they, they, it's automated. It's their customer service agent represents us. And then we can review what they say and then give them feedback mm -hmm. and adjustments. And yeah, they, they're pretty dang solid as well. They uh, will answer questions and act as like a light customer service agent for us. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, they have a pretty high conversion rate too. And luckily I feel like, um, and this may vary, but uh, again, marketers ruin everything. I feel like right now <laughs> SMS is still, people are like, wow, this is really cool. You care about me, but we're seeing more and more people like, what, how did you get my number? What is this? Like, so I think it's, I think it'll, it'll lose its flair at some point. Um, but we do have a, an app that we developed that through like an app builder website. It wasn't 
fancy at all. And it was really cheap, but it definitely shows because it's kind of garbage, but it works for push notifications. And whenever we do new launches, we'll do a teaser to the app users first and then say mm. when the lot, when the drop is going to be going live so they can uh-huh. see the teasers before anyone else and know, you know, a heads up when it, when that's it. So we do, a, I guess you have both SMS and then push notifications through our app. Oh, nice. So what was the name of the app? Uh, Findlay Force. Just okay. the Finley Force app. Yep. And then it's on uh, Android and iOS. And it's talk about, uh, I'm definitely not shouting out the company we're working with to develop them because they have been very useless in helping fix the Android aspect of it. Like older Androids are um, just aren't able to work with the app super well. So it's kind of a headache, but when it works, it's it still works for the notifications, but they can't like get into it. It's, I don't know. Either way, Finley Force app, it's super simple. It doesn't really have too many features, but getting, have you tried to push an app before? It's crazy how tough yeah. it is to get like applied or get approved. There's mm-hmm. so many little hoops to jump through, um, but we have like an archive of almost every, every, every hat we've ever made, like probably 90% of the hats we've ever made uh, on there. And that was kind of the, the feature of the app. But the main thing we wanted was just to push notifications. That's interesting. Uh, in terms of the product like development, uh, like do you have like a person who specifically like develops new designs, new uh, new products, or that's more mostly your responsibility? Like, how do you? At least for the hat designs, I'll, I'll conceptualize like ninety ish percent of what we do, and then work with our two graphic designers um, mm-hmm. to execute those designs. I can think creatively when it comes to hats, and I can get concepts in motion, but I have no control over making that look good using uh you know illustrator or photoshop or anything like that so uh, luckily the designers have been working with for a while and it's really easy to take my crazy ideas and and run with it we usually get them done in a couple revisions it's nothing so that that's at least for the hat production we do actually have a product design intern uh or he was an intern now he's just a full-on employee um Mm -hmm. who's definitely just like the smartest guy in the building he's kind of intimidating to be around because he's just big brain kid um Mm -hmm. but he uh so he helps with a lot of the other like let's see he like we developed wallets for black friday like you know so he fully like yeah so he fully uh designed this thing end to end laser cut it stitched it built it like and so so it's made in the u.s or it's important yeah this is this is made 100 percent right here in our warehouse wow leather patch laser uh laser cut we also sublimated the inside of it. So it has just like some, a logo inside as well. I'm individually numbered, just yeah, real cool setup. So he, he develops the more like complex aspect of it, of so products did, did that we Did you sell out these? Did you sell out these wallets? Yeah, so that was, a, so that was our Black Friday uh, bundle. Wow. We did two hats, a shirt, the wallet, a flag, and a bottle opener. Six items, I think, for a hundred bucks. And uh-huh. we had just a limit of 200 of them. And uh, yeah, those we we sold out of those, and we're gonna make more wallets probably come this coming year, but uh, no individual ones yet. Um, that was the, our first time doing those two. What's the cost? Is this very expensive to make wallets? Like no, not too bad. Okay. I mean, it's you know, it's just the cost is just the the leather and laser time and then stitching. So it really wasn't too bad. The time for each one uh, went down as we got a little bit better at running them, but. Um, mm-hmm. I forget the the final cost for us, but it really was, it was not bad and, you know, definitely solid margins. I mean, more expensive than a hat for us, but still not too bad. And again, hundred percent made in America, American yeah, leather. That's, that's right why here. I, everyone, everyone, everything is pretty much is imported, you know, the wallet. Mm-hmm. So it's very interesting. You know, and that, that's one of the beauties of having this warehouse space. We have uh, like a 5,500 square foot space with embroidery machines, laser cutters, uh, automatic grommet press, automatic screen printing press, 3D printer, sewing machines, sergers, all that sublimation printer, heat presses. So when that stuff, we slowly added to the the lineup over the years. And, you mm-hmm. know, again, start in the living room with barely anything. And uh, I've been slowly adding more and more of the arsenal to the lineup here. And by having all these tools, it allows us to like quickly make wallets or mm-hmm. quickly make a flag or quickly make a bag. And, you know, so we have a lot of tools at our disposal to do that. And it makes these limited drops for other products too pretty easy the bat that you have on the back end on the on the back uh the bat the baseball bat oh yeah you make those as well ha, no but that's my most one of my most prized possessions that's a, a autographed edgar martinez baseball bat if you're from uh the northwest or the seattle area or follow uh, baseball on the west coast edgar big name just got inducted into the hall of fame he's the reason why seattle baseball still has a team <laughs> nice yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no bats made in house yet, but we do have some bats strategically placed around the warehouse in case we need to cause some, or, you know, someone tries to cause <laughs> problems. 
protect like people who copy your products. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. You, you're absolutely right, Alex. That's exactly what it's for. <laughs> How is uh do you do some retail like do you sell products in retail stores or yeah um, so we do uh, a big piece of our brand actually is collaborations so we make hats for other companies and that's a pretty big focus for us and we've made hats from to really large companies like Toyota or the X Games oh, wow. or Heckler and Koch all the way down to like you know a coffee shop up the street and you know mm -hmm. some like small so we have a nice range of hats we'll make for other companies uh, uh, so that's one piece of it but then we do also we are, are also carried in a handful of wholesale stores across the country uh, mostly like skate and surf and kind of outerwear lifestyle stores um, mm -hmm. our biggest account is zoomies um, and we're in about 100 to 200 locations with them and it kind of varies they're they're a skateboard chain and they're in i think they have 600 something locations across the oh, country wow. and we're in about a, what is that a third of them at, at peak if they you know restock so but yeah so that's a cool account and uh it's definitely it's really interesting because anyone in our space that is listening that we're on the t-shirt brand or outdoor apparel brand or anything like that mm -hmm. i know for me personally i thought getting into zoomies was going to be the peak of running a company and we'd be getting these, you know, hundred thousand dollar purchase orders and these like it would be the the best thing to happen to the brand. And it just has not been the case. We get we still get orders from them throughout the year and we've kind of plateaued with them. We kind of expect we know like how many like hats we're gonna send each time. But it's just interesting. Anyone listening to this I that is in this space, like getting into retail used to be the answer. It used to be the dream to be like carried in that cool streetwear shop in your town downtown or whatever or get into zoomies and um, and that's one of the things that people in my space that are, are like, will reach out. That's one of the things they're most curious about how we did it. And uh -huh. it's honestly like, it's, it's cool and it's great for street cred and it's great for reaching new people. And uh, it's, it's been an awesome opportunity and I hope we can keep that account forever, but it's not, it didn't like take us to the next level mm -hmm. outside of reputation. Maybe when we were a lot smaller, it was cool, but mm -hmm. you know, it, it really was not that crazy. I mean, we've spent, we have probably made more now, but for the first couple of years, we definitely spent more money visiting Zoomies to go into every store and show them how our hats work and meet the team and, and bring them donuts and, Get and bring them a care package and get them stoked on the brand. And we spent more money traveling across the country visiting the Zoomies, visiting the stores than we did actually from sales from those stores. Mm -hmm. um, that was the investment, you know, in the relationship. So, um, how is that? Does it do the retailers typically squeeze you for margins? Hey, you know, you have to lower the price. No, nope. They're on it. And I mean, it, it varies. I'm sure they're the only major retailer well one of the two that we'd be interested in but no they're extremely fair and they're uh they have been pretty good to work with on that end their terms are great it's yeah really no complaints about that at all and they they were very upfront like these are the margins we need so when you whatever your wholesale price is just factor that in mm -hmm. and obviously they start with a small order to see how it does and if it does well they order more so their risk is low and if you if you you put a horrible bid in your stuff's not going to do well and they're never gonna you know sell it so Mm -hmm. um, no, they were honestly pretty easy to work with. And I mean, our pricing's fair and ball caps or hats in general are, you know, not uh, too crazy of a, a price point. So easy to keep within like the standards of everything. Tell me about that story. Like you, you had that, you had that story with Reddit post. Oh yeah. The Reddit post. So this is, yeah, yeah. yeah this is our, uh, our one little viral moment. So I was traveling to, uh, to Italy. It was like the first trip like legitimate, like big trip I went on in years uh, since Finley started. My sister mm -hmm. was going to school there and I'm with my family there to visit. And uh, Sarah and I were still together at the time we were, when we were traveling. We're in a like little van and uh, mm -hmm. a tour and we're just driving down the streets of Rome. And I look out the window and just like not even two feet away, like honestly, like the guy was like as close as he could have been to the van without being <laughs> inside. It was straight up next to my face it was super trippy but he was wearing one of our hats and it it was such a surreal thing to look through the window and see the hat and i took a second to register but i was like oh no like stop the car and the guy was just like didn't really know why but i jumped out and i chased the guy down and and ran up to him and i was like hey man like where'd you get that hat like that's so cool and he he i guess he got it like the night before or two nights two nights before from like some random guy at a bar somewhere in the uk uh -huh. he had traveled with that hat from there to italy for like his buddy's stag bachelor party and uh 
they were just they were really drunk and the guy was kind of out of it but <laughs> uh, i was like yeah like that's so cool like where'd you get that hat he's like i got to the bar blah blah blah. i was like man that's cool like i made that hat he's like what do you mean like i was like it has it, it has the laces and and the pocket and he's like what and then he uh he pulled out I, I he took the hat off and as soon as he saw that i knew it had a pocket i guess at that point it registered that like i wasn't i actually did make the hat i guess uh-huh. and he so was kind of i don't know he was kind of confused but also excited too and we took a photo and that was it and kind of went our separate ways and the rest of the day i was like feeling really excited just because of how mm-hmm. surreal that experience was and we had seen you know hat, we, we, at that time we had sold thousands of hats and we'd seen a couple around town and you know had friends and whatever say they saw someone wearing a hat in a random spot but to be in Italy and see one of our hats was just super, super surreal. But that's where Reddit comes in. I, I posted a picture of it on Reddit under the uh, the picture section, uh, Reddit uh, r-picks. And um, I still remember the title. The post is still there. Anyone listening can go <laughs> wallow in the uh, experience. But it's, uh, I run a small hat company based out of my garage. I recently ran into someone wearing one of our hats on the other side of the planet in Rome, Italy. Pretty surreal experience to say the least. I know that's a mouthful. It was a long post. And then there's just a picture of me, whoa, wearing the same shirt I have right now. <laughs> Didn't plan that. Also had a very stra- scraggly beard then. I haven't been able to get it trimmed due to COVID. Um, but yeah, we, we were at the time it was not due to COVID. It was just I had a scraggly beard. But yeah, I posted the picture and on Reddit, it just blew up. And I've had some stuff at the front page there before for my photo career. And you can kind of tell when the momentum's taking off and the the uh, post is getting traction. And it was just, you know, you'd refresh the page and it'd have 50 more upvotes, 100 more upvotes. And mm-hmm. it was just going up, 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 up. And uh, yeah, and then the sales started coming in. And then, yeah, it, it was it was nuts. Overnight, we ended up doing around, and, and it's okay. I'm not sure if it was overnight or over a two day period, but it was ended up being around twenty eight thousand dollars in sales or over twenty eight thousand in sales. The website did like sixty thousand visitors, and at the time, that was like I think a whole year's worth of traffic for us because wow. we were only like two years old at the time. It was a whatever it was. It was a lot of traffic. Photo had two something million views, and uh, mm-hmm. I learned our customer service pay or our customer service app that we used had multiple pages potentially in there. <laughs> Didn't know that wow. it could, it could, you know, queue up so long. And uh, yeah. And this all happened the second day on our trip in Italy of a 14 day trip when there was one employee back at the uh, garage, who was also our roommate. So yeah, it was a little chaotic. What, was that like the launch pad? Like since then you started to grow the brand or no, no, not really. Uh, honestly, it was an awesome spike, but again, just like the zoomies thing going viral, wasn't the, you know, we, everything leveled off at maybe a slightly higher average, but no, it wasn't the, it wasn't the catalyst to get us where we are today. It didn't yield long-term scaling effects. It, it, it was short-term major influx of cash and new customers. And we still have plenty of those customers to this day. Um, mm-hmm. But it was not that big boost um, that really helped us grow it did help us buy our uh, second embroidery machine uh it was a forehead machine so we could do four embroidered four hats at the same time mm-hmm. um so that was a really cool you know piece of it but past that no we went right back to normal but we do have a catalyst we do have a major uh piece that did excel our growth what what was that there's a leading question there uh-huh. um, <laughs> it was just learning how to do strategic facebook advertising and we had dabbled in it for a while, but had never actually really understood a strong prospecting and retargeting journey and strategy. Mm-hmm. And I think it was 2017, we we're having a, not a great year and sales were down and mm-hmm. we needed something to change. And I knew that scaling I mean, like, like sales, not great. You mean like, is yeah, sales were bad. Out? Sales were down for the first year. Probably actually had- losing money or just like not on a positive trend? Um, it was not on a positive trend and we weren't, we weren't doing, we were, we were just, our sales were down basically. And uh-huh. again, it was, we, you know, we worked out of the garage. The employees that we had were lived at the house and no one was really making money with it. We were all like surviving off of it, but we weren't like, mm-hmm. you know, making big paychecks from it or anything like that. But mm-hmm. it was just trending down. It's like, we need to change something. Yeah. Cause every year up to that point, we had doubled in growth or so. And mm-hmm. this year we're not seeing that grow. So it's like, okay, I need to buckle down and understand how to actually, you know, run effective Facebook ads. 
And so I just hopped on Udemy, took a couple courses, uh, took the, fa- yeah, took the Facebook blueprint, did the, and then did two, some courses on Udemy. People ask, people ask like, oh, what courses I need to buy? Like, like you probably don't need many, like very expensive courses you can buy on Facebook ads. Yeah. Yep. Nope. Udemy spent 15 bucks on it. Uh, the return on investment on those $15 Udemy courses are, I don't know, like they've definitely brought in millions of dollars in sales off of $15 spent. So the, uh, definitely a good, I feel like I need to go reach out to those guys and like send them an Amazon gift card or something. Cause yeah, but I spent, I spent like a week, maybe two weeks just diving in and just watching these courses and getting a better understanding of how to run a, a strong prospecting campaign, how to build a better landing page, how to get a sales funnel, how to all this stuff that is, you know, like out there and i mean i I knew i guess landing page to a degree but not one that was from your prospecting campaign specifically and and all that and Mm -hmm. just buckled down and that's where the hockey stick growth came and that's where we went from doing like 10 orders a day to 100 orders a day was just (laughs) facebook advertising in a more strategic manner and Mm -hmm. uh yeah so that was the that was the hockey stick growth not the feature on reddit not the like did your approach like change like over the years like as obviously facebook evolves becomes more competitive or most of the things that worked for you back then still work for you till today honestly it's i mean you know it's a anyone in the space knows it's a battlefield and it changes and it's it's constantly Mm -hmm. evolving but the basics are more or less still the same and it's weird because a lot of times i mean i was actually watching your podcast earlier this week and I forget which, uh, who you were talking with, but it was interesting seeing inside their ad account. It was just, I don't know. You're, I'm all, it's always interesting to see like different strategies through it. Um, mm-hmm. But I, it's it's weird how even with messing with new new strategies, new content, new whatever you're, you're going for, some of the tried and true stuff just stays consistent. And it's tough to mm-hmm. outperform those dinosaurs, at least for us that have just been like a constant, solid uh, piece of it. So, I mean, some of our... our older we've been we've, we keep campaigns on for months and they still will outperform anything new that we try to bring on that on paper is going to be better or do whatever so i love the 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 whole concept of you just need one right like just one strong competing or one strong ad set or ad can really you know pull the whole account so it's cool we, we've we found right now that short form stuff is working really well versus longer form for at least for prospecting video outperforming photo but for a while photo was really outperforming video uh mm-hmm. and we had a this super simple photo of like two of our hats <laughs> someone holding two of our hats and it was like click for 15 off that just outperformed any other long form sh- cool yeah. photo action photo more hats less hats just yeah so i mean we, we would constantly experiment with it and this isn't my uh content but this is my wh- how I, I approach it based off of however many different you know marketers i've listened to on it but you know have a the strong offer have <laughs> the good content to the right audience and that those three i think basics as long as those three are at the top of what you're you're working towards you know i think you'll you'll should be okay and if you're failing that's it one of those things might not be right you know, so, mm-hmm. but when you have those three aligned, it still seems like the, the advertising platform is still working to this day is the same. Mm-hmm. It was back then, obviously worse and CPMs are way up and our results are, are down, but still at a, a profitable amount. Another big strategy that, uh, I highly recommend is, uh, Hyros. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, you use Yeah. That's I've been working. using that for the last half year or so, and it's a game changer. Um, right. it's, it's we definitely, also, you, you like it? Yeah. 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 We like it. Good. I, uh, it's, it's really nice just to see the actual results. We found that, I know it's funny, we're talking about scaling stuff here and we found that we, we still, even with the full data have issues mm-hmm. scaling past about a thousand a day. And we just have backed off even attempting that, uh, right now through holiday stuff. And it's such a wishy-washy time. Right. But, Mm -hmm. um, it's still, it just makes things so much easier to see what you're actually getting. And it's also, it's nice to know a confirmation that I'm not crazy and that the results never really seemed right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's nice seeing like, okay, that this actually does look right. Or, okay. I thought that was doing horrible and, or I thought that was doing way better than it said it was. So um, that it's been nice because you're you're just not shooting in the dark, and that's been a really big piece of the strategy changing the last little bit. And you do also like Google, like some other channels, or mostly Facebook. Yeah, and 
that's yeah we do um, and we use a, a plugin through uh, through shopify for that and that's actually a stone that hasn't been fully unturned yet and that like it's there's still food on the table to be eaten there that we're not fully taking advantage of so we do spend on uh google every day but not our, our ad spend there is a lot lower but our results are really good through it and i'm not just sure if that's we're seeing that because of you know, like <laughs> traffic or they're searching or what but yeah. So uh, we're, that's, that is one zone that does need a little bit more focus. It's kind of, I passed it off to the agency and uh, they're not as vocal as some of the other people we've worked with. So uh, mm -hmm. 21 will definitely be focusing more, especially with the iOS 14 update. Uh, we want to be, you know, constantly looking for the next thing that can help mm -hmm. us survive that. So we'll see where, where that goes. Right. But how's like, do you do any like YouTube? So you mentioned that you, uh, you have the outreach to influencers and that has been that has proven to be like, you know, pretty successful for you. Like, do you do outreach to uh, like Instagram influencers or YouTube influencers, like people that have, you know, like a lot of subscribers on YouTube or, or only like TikTok, what channels do you typically Yeah, have? so we do Instagram and Instagram is still like a big focus for us. So we haven't forgot fully about that. And we do outreach pretty much every day on there. One of our employees who works remotely out of Seattle, um, does mm -hmm. customer service. And then he does social media outreach where he's just constantly directly engaging with people on their Instagram accounts, mm -hmm. going to their page, asking questions, liking their posts, starting a conversation. And, and we'll do a variety of different strategies there where it's either going off of our, our prospecting campaign ads and people who've liked that post and going into their page and, and engaging or mm -hmm. going to competitors pages and going to their followers and, and directly engaging with them. Um, mm -hmm. Or following hashtags, like there's a uh, like my hat collection or something like that hashtag, and then going mm -hmm. in there and commenting with those people because those are people who are, you know, they they collect hats but they don't collect our hats, so we kind of you know we get in through there. So there's lots their, of what was that integrating like into their like exactly. Community. So there's there's lots of opportunity within Instagram to do that, and we're lucky to be able to afford to you know pay an employee to you know spend a couple hours a, a day almost doing that type of outreach. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of those, again, not my thing, but the do stuff you can't scale things where it's like, it's, you know, you it's, there's no robot that can do genuine comments like that. Obviously there's bots that can be like, this is sweet, but no one can, is going to go in and be like, man, I love that inward heel flip. Like that park looks really cool. What's your favorite feature there? You know? So, and we, we used <laughs> early on, we used those bots and they were great for, you know, our, our growth was way faster using the bot stuff when we were significantly, when they was less sketchy and uh -huh. was was out there and now we don't touch that stuff but um we also had a handful of worst case scenarios where you know the bot would comment some really bad things on some bad things <laughs> and uh yeah we had some, we had some bad stuff through it so <laughs> that's the risk of using a bot versus a real human so so yeah we do outreach there we don't push youtube too hard youtube's tough to break into we have we've sent stuff to people who do unboxing we've stuff <laughs> we've sent stuff to a handful of like big name YouTubers and they featured us on like their vlogs and that side of things, but um, nothing too crazy on YouTube. That's another venture. That's just not super easy to break into for us, but we're, it, you know, it's still something we're would pursue, want to pursue. What were like the main lessons that you like from, from your like entrepreneurial career, like starting, you know, from zero, you know, this, this brand, like growing this to this level, what have been like your main lessons Ooh. that you've learned? Dealing with people, I think is one, like it's, you know, again, started two of us in a living room and now we're 18 ish people. So mm -hmm. the lesson of just, you know, I, I come from a, a boy scout background. I'm an Eagle scout. They teach leadership. They teach, you know, camaraderie. They teach how to like get along with people, but doing it in a professional environment is a, a piece that like, when you're like, yeah, I want to start a business. I want to, I have these big, big dreams and I want to, you know, sell thousands of things online and buy a Lambo and whatever, like the, the whole, like, you know, doing it solo versus bringing a team on board. I don't know. There's, it's a, it's a crazy world when you have people that rely on you to live and you rely on them to keep the dream alive. So the, the leadership lessons, how to set an environment where people want to come into work and want to do their best job and want to be creative and want to push it and want to achieve something together and not just come in here and you know, push pencils all day and leave. They want to like actually be a part of it. So I think just 
caring about the team, I guess, is a, a piece of something I've learned in, along the way because so many people vary. There's so many different dynamics and personalities and things. So just leadership in and of itself is a big thing. Um, and I think just caring about the people that you employ mm-hmm. is a lesson that I've learned. Uh, I don't know if that's a lesson that I just told anyone about that they learned from, but um, I, I take great pride in our team. We have unlimited time off. We have like, you know, full benefits. We have a chill work environment. It's if, oh, the mountain, there's, there's snow at the mountain today. You want to go shred? Like go for it. Uh, have fun up there. So it's, we try to, you know, like we say, our, our tagline is our brand's built for good times. We want our employees to be able to have those good times. Um, mm-hmm. So that's one. And then second two is just the, again, this is a super basic thing, but like, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Like every, you know, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to run into problems. You're going to have errors. You're going to have bad days, bad seasons, bad, whatever. And you just can't roll over and die. You know, pandemics might come and, and wipe out your, <laughs> your main source of income, but uh, you know, how are you going to pivot to stay in motion? What are you going to do there? Mm-hmm. So I think it's, you know, like bad stuff comes your way, the, but it's how you way react. It hits you, right? The same way it hits you, like when you have to figure out the Facebook advertising part. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're responsible for your future when you're running the business, you know, there's no handbook, there's gurus, there's guides, there's books, there's all that, but that's for them. That's their method of getting to, you mm-hmm. know, their, their stuff. It's, you know, you got to, blaze your own trail to get to where you want to do. And that's why, you know, it's important to learn and listen and uh, take in as much info as you can, because you're, you know, your subconscious is all of that info guiding you to where you want to go. So you're taking bits of this guy, bits of this guy, bits of this podcast, you know, then that's kind of, you know, fueling forward. So yeah, a rambly answer, but I think there's some good points in there, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And number three, <laughs> number three, don't be afraid. Oh, this is, this should be number one. Cause this is just, don't let fear stop you from doing what you want to do. And that can be a big picture for someone who's listening, who just wants to get started or someone who's been doing it for longer than I have, but they're still maybe on the fence about this new thing they want to get into. Every time you bring something new to the world from a creative standpoint, you run the risk of rejection. You have the fear of people not liking it, the fear of failure. And I mean, that's like a hardwired thing in our brains from like caveman life, right? Or caveman life. So it's like, everyone's hardwired to not do something out of fear and you can't let that hold you back. And like every wise person ever has some cool quote about don't let fear hold you back from doing what you want to do. And I mean, you know, I see and talk about, you know, I still suffer from that with every single product launch we do every Mm -hmm. single week when we launch stuff, it's like, man, like I think these look cool, but are people going to buy them? You know, are people going to think that we're like sellouts? There's always like worries about that stuff, even at this stage. And it's getting past that point where you trust, talk about what I said in the previous answer, when you start to trust your creative vision, your natural instinct and your knowledge on the subject, and you start to really trust that is when you can really shine. Because at the end of the day, if you're creating stuff, the, uh, you know, you got to trust yourself that the world wants what you're going to create out there. And I mean, after mm-hmm. seven years in business now, it's still not easy, but it gets a little easier every time. And I think uh, you can't let fear stop you from doing what you want to do. And everyone faces that, but it's important to just keep pushing through it. Is that like this feeling, like God feeling, like when it's like, you know, is that, is that it? Or is that something different? I think, like, yeah, it's like, it's totally, I think it's like the gut feeling, both in the fear of getting, uh, you know, the rejection aspect of it, but then also the, your gut feeling is like your subconscious that's picking up all of this info you've known your, you know, through listening to all this stuff and reading and observing and and all this different stuff. So, I mean, it's your, I think that gut feeling is also your subconscious leading you towards like what needs to be done. And, uh, you know, it's not at top of mind, but it's, it's in there. (laughs) So, um, a lot of the things that we covered, I mean, those are the foundational things, you know, and I think that overall, like, you know, seeing entrepreneurs, I have, I have Facebook group, like with like 50,000 people. And, you know, the people like the, the things that people talk about, there's like this little, like saying, like how to do this thing on Facebook, you know, like how to do this, you know, like very little, the things that we have covered. And that's for everyone who listens. I mean, those are like foundational things in terms of the, like the same as you outlined with Facebook, like, you know, those are the major things, the major important things, product offer, you know, the audience, dialing in on that message that you know i think everyone can benefit from because most of the times like the the issues the problems when they arise are typically because you know we 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 stop paying attention to the foundations not because we miss some like some advanced yeah thing. 
(laughs) Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's easy to get lost in the little day-to-day things or the little tasks and and forget your roots or forget those foundations that, you know, are the most important aspects of it. Yeah. And thank you so much. It was amazing um, chatting with you and um, I'm sure everyone learned a lot from this interview and um, I'm looking forward to, you know, let's stay in touch. I'm looking forward for you to see how you explode this brand farther and, uh, Thank you, everyone, for listening. Heck yeah, Alex. Thank you for having me. I'm definitely uh, grateful to uh, be here. And uh, if any of your listeners have any further questions, always happy to expand or uh, answer any questions you may have. Just shoot me an email, jimmy at finleyhats.com. Yeah, and we have, uh, we'll have the links also to your brand uh, so people can check out your products. Maybe you'll find some people who, who love your products as well. And uh, thank you, man, for sharing. Absolutely. Open book. Thanks for having me, Alex. Hope you uh, have a great uh, 2021. I think it's going to be a great year. Yeah, you do. Thank you, Jim. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. If you can just like this video and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of my videos in the future. Thank you.